Book One, Chapter Two, Part Four of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lea. Book One, Chapter Two: The Jews and the Moors, Part Four. The Church accordingly viewed with repugnance the policy of conciliation and toleration which had so greatly facilitated the work of the reconquest, and it lost no opportunity of exciting popular distrust and contempt of the Mudejares. We shall see how great was its success with respect to the Jews, whose position offered better opportunity for attack, but it was not without results as respects the Moors. It discouraged all intercourse between the races, and endeavored to keep them separate. Even the indispensable freedom of ordinary commercial dealings, which was provided for by the secular rulers, was frowned upon, and in 1250 the Order of Santiago was obliged to represent to Innocent IV that it had Moorish vassals, and to supplicate him for license to buy and sell with them, which he graciously permitted. The most efficacious means, however, of establishing and perpetrating the distinction between the races was that Moors and Jews should wear some peculiar garment or badge by which they should be recognized by sight. It was not only a mark of inferiority and a stigma, but it exposed the wearer to insults and outrages, rendering it both humiliating and dangerous, especially to those such as the muleteers or merchants, whose avocations render travel on the unsafe highways indispensable. When the church was aroused from its torpor to combat infidelity in all its forms, it was one of the measures adopted by the Great Council of Lateran in 1216, in a regulation carried into canon law, the reason alleged being it was necessary to prevent miscegenation. In 1217, Honorius III peremptively ordered the enforcement of this decree in Castile, but, two years later, consented to suspend it, on the remonstrance of San Fernando III, backed by Rodrigo, Archbishop of Toledo. The king represented that many Jews would abandon his kingdom rather than wear badges, while the rest would be driven to plots and conspiracies, and, as the greater part of his revenues were derived from them, he would be unable to carry out his enterprises against the Saracens. It was difficult to arouse intolerance and race hatred in Spain and when Gregory the Ninth, about 1233, and Innocent the IV in 1250, ordered the Castilian prelates to enforce the Lateran canons, San Fernando quietly disregarded the injunction. His son, Alfonso X, so far yielded obedience that, in the Partidas, he ordered, under a penalty of ten gold maravides, or ten lashes, all Jews, male and female, to wear a badge on the cap, alleging the same reason as the Lateran Council, but he did not extend this to the Moors, and his code was not confirmed by the Cortes for nearly a century. The regulation may be regarded as inoperative. The Council of Zamora, which did so much to stimulate intolerance, in January 1313, ordered the badge to be worn, as it was in other lands, and, later in the year, the Cortes of Placencia uh, proposed to obey, but were told by the Infante Juan, who presided as guardian of Alfonso XI, that he would, after consultation, do what was for the advantage of the land. In Aragon, the councils of Tarragona, in 1238 and 1282, vainly ordered the canon to be obeyed, and it was not until 1300 that the attempt was made with an ordinance requiring the Mudejares to wear the hair cut in peculiar fashion that should be distinctive. In Castile, at length, Henry II, in pursuance of the request of the Cortes of Toro in 1371, ordered all Jews and Moors to wear the badge, a red circle on the left shoulder. But the abjunction had to be frequently repeated and was slenderly obeyed. Even so, to it may be attributed the frequent murders which followed of Jews on the highways, the perpetrators of which were rarely identified. What was the spirit which the Church, thus persistently endeavored to arouse in Spain, may be gathered from a brief of Clement IV in 1266, 
to Jaime I of Aragon, urging him to expel all Mudejares from his dominions. He assures the king that his reputation will suffer greatly if, for temporal advantage, he longer permits such opprobrium of God, such an infection of Christendom, as proceeds indubitably from the horrible cohabitation of the Moors, with its detestable horrors and horrid foulness. By expelling them he will fulfill his vow to God, stop the mouths of his detractors, and prove himself zealous for the faith. The same temper was shown in 1278 by Nicholas III, when he scolded Alfonso X for entering into truces with the Moors, and by threatening to deprive him of the share granted to him of the church revenues, incited him to the disastrous siege of the Algeciras, the failure of which led him to form an alliance with the king of Morocco. Fortunately, this papal zeal for the faith found no Ximenes in Spain to spread it among the people and to kindle the fires of intolerance. The Spanish church of the period appears to have been wholly quiescent. The only action on record is the trivial one of Arnado de Peralta, Bishop of Valencia, from 1261 to 1273, who forbade, under the pain of excommunication, his clergy from drinking wine in the house of a Jew, provided that they should have heard of or should remember the prohibition, and he further vaguely threatened, with his displeasure, any cleric who should knowingly buy the wine of a Jew, except in the case of necessity. That, in the confusion which followed the rebellion of Sancho the Fourth against his father, there may have arisen a desire to limit somewhat the privileges of Jews and Moors, is rendered probable by the legislation of the Cortes of Valladolid, in 1293, to which allusion has already been made. But the decisive impulse which aroused the Spanish church from its indolent indifference and set it earnestly to work in the exciting popular hatred and intolerance would seem to be traceable to the Council of Vienna in 1311 and 12. Among the published canons of the Council, the only one related to Moors is the complaint that those dwelling in Christian lands have their priests, called Zabazala, who, from the minarets of their mosques, at certain hours of invoke Mohammed, and sound his praises in a loud voice, and also that they are accustomed to gather around the grave of one whom they worship as a saint. These practices are denounced as unendurable, and the princes are ordered to suppress them, with the alternative of gaining salvation, or of enduring punishment, which shall make them serve as a terrifying example. This threat fell upon deaf ears, in 1329, the Council of Tarragona complains of its inobservance and orders all temporal lords to enforce it within two months, under pain of interdict and excommunication. And a hundred years later, the Council of Tortosa, in 1429, supplicated the King of Aragon and all prelates and nobles, by the bowels of divine mercy, to enforce the canon and all other councillor decrees for the exaltation of the faith and the humiliation of Jews and Moors, and to cause their observance by their subjects if they wish to escape the vengeance of God and of the Holy See. This was entirely ineffectual, and it was reserved for Ferdinand and Isabella, about 1482, to enforce the canon of Vienna with a vigor which brought a remonstrance from the great Turk. More serious was the effect upon the Jews of the spirit awakened at Vienna, that council, besides enacting very severe laws against usury, denounced the privilege accorded in Spain to Jews, whereby Jewish witnesses were requisite for the conviction of Jewish defendants. It did not presume to annul this privilege, but forbade all intercourse between the races whenever it was in force. The Spanish prelates, in returning from the council in 1312, brought with them these canons and the spirit of intolerance that dictated them and made haste to give expression to it in the Council of Zamora, in January 1313, in a number of canons, the temper of which is so different from the previous utterances of the Spanish Church, that it shows the revolution wrought in their mode of thinking by intercourse with their brethren from other lands. Henceforth, in this respect, the Spanish Church emerges from its isolation, and distinguishes itself by even greater ferocity than that which disgraced the rest of Christendom. The fathers of Zamora invoked the curse of God and of St. Peter on all who should endeavor to enforce the existing laws requiring the evidence of Jews to convict Jews. 
They denounced the Jews as serpents, who were only to be endured by Christians because they were human beings, but were to be kept in strict subjugation and servitude, and they sought to reduce the principle to practice by a series of canons, restricting the Jews in every way, and putting an end to all social intercourses between them and Christians. The friendly mingling of the races, which shows how little the prejudices of the churchmen were shared by the people at this period, became a favorite subject of objurgation, and required a long series of efforts to eradicate. But the church triumphed at last, and the seeds of envy, hatred, and all uncharitableness, which it so assiduously planted and cultivated, yielded in the end an abundant harvest of evil. What prepossessions of Christian kindness the prelates of Zamora felt that they had to overcome are indicated in the final command that these constitutions should be read publicly in all churches annually, and that the bishops should compel, by excommunication, all secular magistrates to enforce them. The Spanish church, thus fairly started in this deplorable direction, pursued its course with characteristic energy. In 1322, the utterances of the Council of Valladolid reveal how intimate were the customary relations between Christian and infidel, and how the church, in place of taking advantage of this, labored to keep the races asunder. The Council re recites that scandals arise and churches are profaned by the prevailing custom of Moors and Jews attending divine service. Wherefore, they are to be expelled before the ceremonies of the Mass begin, and all those who endeavor to prevent it are to be excommunicated. The habit of nocturnal devotional vigils in churches is also said, probably with truth, to be the source of much evil, and all who bring Moors and Jews to take part with their voices and instruments are to be expelled. To preserve the faithful from pollution by Moorish and Jewish superstitions, they are commanded no more to frequent the weddings and funerals of the infidels. The absurd and irrational abuse, whereby Jews and Moors are placed in office over Christians, is to be extirpated, and all prelates should punish it with excommunication. As the malice of the Moors and Jews leads them craftily to put Christians to death, under the pretext of curing them by medicine and surgery, and as the canons forbid Christians from employing them as physicians, and as these canons are not observed in consequence of the negligence of the prelates, the latter are ordered to enforce them strictly, with the free use of excommunication. These last two clauses point to matters which had long been special grievances of the faithful, and which demand a moment's attention. The superior administrative abilities of the Jews caused them to be constantly sought for executive positions, to the scandal of all good Christians. We have seen that, under the Goths, it was an abuse calling for constant amiadversion. It was one of the leading complaints of Innocent III against Raymond VI of Toulouse, which he expiated so cruelly in the Albigensian Crusades, and one of the decrees of the Lateran Council was directed against its continuance. In Spain, the sovereigns could not do without them, and we shall have occasion to see that it became one of the main causes of popular dislike of the unfortunate race, for the Christian found it hard to bear with equanimity the dominion of the Jew, especially in his ordinary character of the Almoharife, or tax collector. As early as 1118, Alfonso VIII, in the Fuero granted to Toledo, promised that no Jew or recent convert should be placed over the Christians. Alfonso X made the same concession in the Fuero of Alicante in 1215, except that he reserved the office of Almoharife, and in the Partidas he endeavored to make the rule general. The same necessity made itself felt in regard to the function of the physician, for which, during the Dark Ages, the learning of Jew and Saracen rendered them almost exclusively fitted. Zechadias, the Jewish physician of Emperor Charles the Bald, was renowned, and tradition handed down his name as that of a skillful magician. Prince and prelate alike sought comfort in their curative ministrations, and, as the church looked askance on the practice of medicine and surgery by ecclesiastics, unless it were through prayer and exorcism, they had the field almost to themselves. This had always been regarded with disfavor by the church. As early as 706, the Council of Constantinople had ordered the faithful not to take medicine from a Jew, and this command had been incorporated in the canon law. 
Another rule, adopted from the Lateran Council of 1216, was that the first duty of a physician was to care for the soul of the patient rather than for the body, and to see that he was provided with a confessor, a duty which the infidel could scarce be expected to recognize. It was therefore easy to understand why the general abhorrence of the church for Moor and Jew should be sharpened with particular acerbity in regard to their functions as physicians, why the council of Valladolid should endeavor to alarm the people with the assertion that they utilized the position to slay the faithful, and the council of Salamanca in 1335 should renew the sentence of excommunication on all who should employ them in sickness. Nominally, the church carried its point, and in the prescriptive laws of 1412 there was embodied a provision imposing a fine of 300 maravedis on any Moor or Jew who should visit a Christian in sickness or administer medicine to him. But the prohibition was impossible of enforcement. About 1462, the Franciscan Alonso de Espina bitterly complains that there is not a noble or a prelate, but keeps a Jewish devil as a physician although the zeal of the Jews in studying medicine is simply to obtain an opportunity of exercising their malignity upon Christians. For one whom they cure, they slay fifty, and when they are gathered together, they boast of as to which has caused the most deaths. For their law commands them to spoil and to slay the faithful. It was but a few years after this that Abitar Aben Caracas, chief physician of Juan II of Aragon, the father of Ferdinand, vindicated Jewish science by successfully relieving his royal patient of a double cataract and restoring his sight. On September 11th, 1469, pronouncing the aspect of the stars to be favorable, he operated on the right eye. The king, delighted with his recovered vision, ordered him to proceed with the left, but Abitar refused, alleging that the stars had become unfavorable and it was not until October 12th that he consented to complete the cure. The friars themselves believed as little as royalty in the stories which they invented to frighten the people and create abhorrence of Jewish physicians. In spite of the fact that Ferdinand and Isabella, in the Ordinesas of 1480, repeated the prohibition of their attending Christians, the Dominicans in 1489 obtained from Innocent IV permission to employ them notwithstanding all ecclesiastical censures, the reason alleged being that in Spain there were few others. The prescriptive spirit which dominated the councils of Zamora and Valladolid was not allowed to die out. That of Tarragona in 1329 expressed its horror at the friendly companionship with which Christians are in the habit of attending the marriages, funerals, and circumcisions of Jews and Moors, and even of entering into the bonds of compaternity with the parents, all of which it strictly forbade for the future. A few years later, in 1337, Arnaldo, Archbishop of Tarragona, addressed to Benedict the Twelfth a letter which is significant expression of all the objects and methods of the Church. In spite, he says, of the vow taken by Jaime I when about to reconquer Valencia, that he would not permit any Moors to remain there, the Christians, led by blind cupidity, allowed them to occupy the land, believing that thus they derived larger revenues, which is an error, as the abbot of Poblet has recently demonstrated by expelling the Mudejares from the possessions of the abbey. There are said to be forty or fifty thousand Moorish fighting men in Valencia, which is the source of the greatest danger, especially now, when the emperor of Morocco is preparing to aid the king of Granada. Besides, many enormous crimes are committed by Christians in consequence of their damnable familiarity in intercourse with the Moors, who blaspheme the name of Christ and exalt that of Mohammed. I have heard, he pursues, the late bishop of Valencia declare in a public sermon that in that province the mosques are more numerous than the churches, and that half, or more than half, the people are ignorant of the Lord's Prayer and speak only in Moorish. I therefore pray your clemency to provide an appropriate remedy, which would seem impossible unless the Moors are wholly expelled, and unless the king of Aragon lends his aid and favor. The nobles would be more readily brought to assent to this if they were allowed to seize and sell the persons and property of the Mudejares as public enemies and infidels, 
and the money thus obtained would be of no small service in defending the kingdom. The Christian prelate, not content with directly asking the Pope to adopt this inhuman proposition, sent a copy of his letter to Jean de Cominge, Cardinal of Porto, and begged him to urge the matter with Benedict, and in a second letter to the Cardinal, he explained that it would be necessary for the Pope to order the King to expel the Moors, that he would willingly obey as to the crown lands, but that a papal command was indispensable as to the lands of others. It was only, he added, the avarice of the Christians which kept the Moors there. We shall see how, two hundred and seventy years later, an Archbishop of Valencia aided in bringing about the final catastrophe by a still greater display of saintly zeal, backed by precisely the same arguments. This constant pressure on the part of their spiritual guides began to make an impression on the ruling classes, and repressive legislation becomes frequent in the Cortes. In those of Soria, in 1380, the obnoxious prayer against Christians was ordered to be removed from Jewish prayer books, and its recitation was forbidden under heavy penalties. While the rabbis were deprived of jurisdiction in criminal cases between their people, in those of Valladolid, in 1385, Christians were forbidden to live among Jews. Jews were prohibited to serve as tax collectors. Their judges were inhibited to act in civil cases between them and Christians, and numerous regulations were adopted to restrain their oppression of debtors. In 1387, at the Cortes of Briviesca, Juan I enacted that no Christian should keep in his house a Jew or more, except as a slave nor converse with one beyond what the law allowed, under heavy penalty of six thousand maravedis, and no Jew or more should keep Christians in his house under pain of confiscation of all property and corporal punishment at the king's pleasure. It seemed impossible to enforce these laws, and the church intervened by assuming jurisdiction over the matter. In 1388 the Council of Valencia required the suspension of labor on Sundays and feast days, and it deplored the injury to the bodies and souls of the faithful, and the scandals arising from the habitual intercourse between them and the infidels. The dwellings of the latter were ordered to be strictly separated from those of the former, where special quarters had not been assigned to them, and it was ordered to be done forthwith, and within two months, no Christian should be found dwelling with them, nor they with the Christians. If they had trades to work at, or merchandise to sell, they should come out during the day, or occupy booths or shops along the street, but at night they must return to the place where they kept their wives and children. This segregation of the Jews and Moors and their strict confinement to the Morejas and Judeiras were a practical method of separating the races, which was difficult of enforcement. The massacres of 1391 showed that there were such quarters generally in the larger cities, but residence therein seems not to have been obligatory and Jews and Moors who desired it lived among the Christians. In the restrictive laws of 1412, the first place is given to this matter. Morejas and Hudejeras are ordered to be established everywhere, surrounded with a wall having only one gate. Any who shall not, in eight days after notice, have settled therein forfeits all his property, and is liable to punishment at the king's pleasure, and severe penalties are provided for Christian women who enter them. An effort was made to enforce these regulations, but it seemed impossible to keep the races apart. In 1480, Ferdinand and Isabella state that the law had not been observed, and order its enforcement, allowing two years for the establishment of the ghettos, after which no Jew or more shall dwell outside of them, under the established penalties, and no Christian woman be found within them. The time had passed for laws to be disregarded and this was carried into effect with the customary vigor of the sovereigns. In Segovia, for instance, on October 29, 1481, Rodrigo Alvarez Modano, commissioner for the purpose, summoned the representatives of the Jewish Alhama, read to them the Ordensa, and designated to them the limits of their Juderia. All Christian residents therein were warned to vacate within the period designated by the law, all Jews of the district were required to make their abode there within the same time, and all doors and windows of houses contiguous to the boundaries on either side, whether of Jews or Christians, were ordered to be walled up or rendered impassable. 
the segregation of the Jews was to be absolute. We shall see in the next chapter how successful were the efforts of the church in arousing the greed and fanaticism of the people, and in repressing the kindly fellowship which had so long existed. From this the Jews were the earliest and greatest sufferers, and it is necessary here to say only that in the cruel laws which marked the commencement of the fifteenth century, both Moor and Jew were included in the restrictions designed to humiliate them to the utmost, to render their lives a burden, and to deprive them of the means of livelihood, and to diminish their usefulness to the state. These laws were too severe for strict and continuous enforcement, but they answered the purpose of inflicting an ineffaceable stigma upon their victims, and of keeping up a wholesome feeling of antagonism on the part of the population at large. This was directed principally against the Jews, who were the chief objects of clerical malignity, and it will be our business to examine how this was skillfully developed, until it became the proximate cause of the introduction of the Inquisition, and created for it, during its earliest and busiest years, almost the sole field of its activity. Meanwhile, it may be observed that, in the closing triumph over Granada, the capitulations accorded by Ferdinand and Isabella were even more liberal to Jews and Moors than those granted from the 11th to the 13th century by such monarchs as Alfonso VI, Ferdinand III, Alfonso X, and Jaime I. Unless they were deliberately designed as perfidious traps, they show how little real conscientious conviction lay behind the elaborately simulated fanaticism which destroyed the Jews and Mudejares. End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 4